Hi everybody, welcome to CS Breakdown, and today we're going to be talking about a dynamic programming approach for change making. So the change making problem is the minimization of the number of coins it takes to make change for n cents given a certain denomination. So in Canada, we use pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. And we don't actually use pennies anymore in Canada, but for the sake of this example, we're going to consider them. So with this specific denomination, it actually is possible to use a greedy algorithm. And it varies on the currency, so there are other den denomination sets you can use that allow for greedy algorithm use. And the greedy algorithm is, of course, to just take the largest coin you can first. So in this case, let's consider n equals 31. Using the Canadian or American system, you would then be able to take 25, 5, and 1. So a quarter, a nickel, and a penny. And that is the optimal number. You can't make 31 cents with less than three coins. But if you consider some denomination like this, using a penny, a nickel, a 12 cent coin, and a quarter, you actually find that you can't use a greedy algorithm. So if you had, say, 16 cents you were trying to make, the greedy problem would take a 12 cent coin and then four pennies, but the optimal, of course, is actually three nickels and a single penny. So in the case that the denomination we've chosen doesn't actually allow for greedy, we can use dynamic programming. So as always, with dynamic programming, the first thing we need to do is prove optimal substructure. So consider some S, which is a set of optimal coins for making N cents. So if we're making N cents, we have the optimal set of coins stored in this S. Now let's remove some arbitrary coin DK. We don't know which denomination this is, but it's somewhere between 1 and M, where M is the size or the maximum um, coin. So if we remove this random coin, we get some S prime is what we'll label it, which is actually just our original S minus that coin. But of course, this is going to be the optimal for n minus d k cents. So s prime is the all of the coins for n cents subtract that uh, single coin d k, and that's going to be the optimal for n minus d k cents. So if it wasn't optimal, let's say, that means that for n minus d k cents, we can replace it with some better solution x. So if this s prime wasn't optimal for the subproblem of n minus dk cents, then there is a better solution, and we're just going to label that x, and we can just replace s prime with x. But of course, this contradicts the original assumption that s was optimal. So by assuming s was optimal, we've shown that this s prime will exist when we subtract an arbitrary coin, but this s prime also has to be optimal, otherwise it's sort of a contradiction. And now we've proven that this optimal substructure exists. So the optimal number of coins for n cents is going to be the optimal built off of the optimal number of coins for n minus, let's say, k cents. It doesn't matter what that k value is. It's just going to be built off of its subproblems. And this is what we need to show to use dynamic programming. So now that we've shown the proof of optimal substructure, we can start to build a recurrence. So we're going to define cp equal to the minimum number of coins for p cents. But as with a lot of dynamic programming solutions, this specific solution is only going to give us a value. So it's only going to give us the number of coins. To keep track, we're actually going to allow for a second array. We're just going to define it as sp, which is going to be the last coin used to make that p cents. And by using this array, we're actually going to be able to later recreate the solution based on the number of coins. So now let's define the recurrence for CP. There's actually only two cases. It's going to be zero in the first case, and in every other case, it's going to be the minimum of the previous, so C of P minus DI plus one. So the plus one means we're adding a coin, and the P minus DI is going to be every denomination from the first denomination, the smallest, up to p. So if p was, say, 5 cents, we would only be able to consider pennies and nickels. If p was uh, 30 cents, we'd be able to consider pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, or perhaps the 12-cent coin we discussed earlier. 
So the reason we do this is because we need to try what would happen if we removed every denomination that's possible. So if we consider our previous example, we can set up the tables and see what we're going to get. So our n was 16 and our set of denominations was 1, 5, 12, and 25. So here are our two tables. They're just two one-dimensional arrays. SP is what we're going to store our previous values in, which were used for the final coin for P cents, and CP we've just defined using that recurrence. So looking at the base case, of course, CP at zero is just going to be zero, and we're going to mark SP at zero as well. Despite the fact that there actually is no zero coin, I'm just using it as a bit of a placeholder because we never consider the zeroth index in array S. So now let's consider at space one. Well, the only coin we can consider is coin number one. So that's the one we're going to take because P equals one cent minus that is going to bring us back to space zero plus one coin. Now if P equals two cents and the only coin we can consider again is a penny because P is not yet larger than our next denomination, then we're going to look at P minus one cents, which is just going to give us one and then we add that next coin and now we have two. Notice that the last coin I've used for both of these is one. So that's going to explain the pattern in S. It's just going to be the coin in that column. So it's going to be filled with ones up until we can use a different denomination. However, it's going to be incrementing in the CP because we're actually adding more coins to our solution. So it's the same explanation for both three and four, and we're just gonna fill those in. But now let's take a look at five. So in five, we actually have two choices. We can take five cents minus one cent, so the solution at four cents plus one coin, which would be the same as adding a penny, which would give us a total of five coins, or now we're able to increment in that second case of the recurrence, and we're able to say five minus five cents, because five cents is our next denomination, and that's gonna bring us back down to zero, and plus one coin, which is our single nickel, and that's going to give us one. So one is obviously less than five, and now we're able to fill that in. So you'll see here that in SP, the last coin we used for this was actually five. So again, this is pretty important for when we're going to reconstruct the solution later. Now the same process is what's going to happen repeatedly. We're going to look at six, and the best thing we can do now is six minus one. Of course we can consider six minus five, but it's actually going to be the same. So six minus five cents is going to give us one plus one, but six minus one cent is going to give us location five, which is gonna give us one plus one. So it's actually gonna be the same regardless of what coin we choose. But of course, that's just because it's the same as choosing um, a nickel and a five cent, or a five cent and, or pardon me, a penny and a nickel, or a nickel and a penny, it's just the order. Now we're going to move forward again, and we're going to consider the remainder. So all of these are going to follow the same process, and what happened was, each of them we just add a penny. So the best thing we can do from this nickel is add a penny and now we have five coins to make nine cents and that is optimal to make nine cents. But now that we're at 10, again, we hit the same case where we were at when we hit five. So the we try adding a penny and that's going to give us six coins because it's gonna be 10 minus one is in location nine and then five plus one, so the the sixth coin is going to be a penny, but we're not going to use six coins because that's less optimal than if we subtract five, which brings us to the array index of five, where we only have one. So it's going to be one plus one versus five plus one. So of course, one plus one is going to be less, and then we have two coins where the previous was five. So again, the same process happens for 11. We just add a penny. Now for 12, the exact same thing as with our first five happens. So we're able to subtract 12 because this is the largest denomination we have. Of course we do also, let's say if we were to program this, we would also end up checking uh, denominations one and five, but we can kind of just jump right to 12 because if the denomination is the same as the value, of course it's only going to require one coin. So now we're going to add a penny to this solution, fairly trivial. 
and then we're going to continue this add a penny but for index 15 we have another case where we're using nickels and this is where the dynamic programming really comes in because the the use of a 12 cent coin is what ruins the greedy algorithm and you could see that even up to 14 cents it's optimal to use um, to use the 12 cent coin however it's not going to work for 15 and higher because 15 is uh, divisible by 5, one of our uh, smaller denominations. So then we're going to subtract to 5, go to space 10, and it's going to be 2 plus 1 versus 3 plus 1. So of course 2 plus 1 is better, and we just add a nickel. So now we have 3 again, and the last coin we used was a 5. So then of course we polish it off just by adding one penny, and our solution is done. We found that it only takes 4 coins. So to find out which four coins, we can look at our SP array. So if you come to the final uh, column in the SP array, you see that we used a penny last. And then next to that, we've used a nickel. And what's going to happen is you're going to subtract that much space from the array, and that's going to give you the composition. So you'll see if we have one, it's going to subtract one space and give us uh, space 15 where we have a nickel and then we'll subtract 5 which will bring us to space 10 and so on and so on and it'll kind of form this pattern here that I've highlighted with the arrows and by doing this we've then highlighted each coin that we're going to use now I highlighted the zeroth place here as well but remember we don't actually have a zeroth coin it's just the final stop in checking um, in checking this array for our coin composition so we see we have three nickels and one penny. And that's the optimal solution for finding 16 cents through, um, through this denomination. So once we've done this, we're actually done. That's all it took. And we were able to come up with a pretty good solution using dynamic programming. And it didn't require us to brute force anything. Because of course, brute force would be an exponential problem. But in this case, we were actually able to solve it in big O of n times k. So here, k is the maximum denomination value we go to at each iteration while incrementing p. So if p was 7, our max, our k, for example, in this case, would be 5, because that's the highest denomination value we can go to. And the reason it's this is because if you were actually just to program it, it you would have two nested loops. One loop would go throughout the length of um, the array, so it would be 16 spaces, or however many cents you're trying to make. And then k would be the maximum uh, denomination you can go to at each iteration. So that's it. And now we've covered the change-making dynamic programming solution. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Please check out our other videos on CS Breakdown. And take care.